Joe Windish has been a visual media professional for over four decades. In 1999, he joined Mediopolis, a web engineering and development company in New York's Silicon Alley. At Mediopolis, he served as a senior producer and project manager, overseeing projects for companies that included Sony Records, Johnson & Johnson, and the New York Times Company. He moved to Milledgeville, Georgia, and in 2004, he opened the Interactive Media Lab in Georgia College and State University's Ina Dillard Russell Library. While there, he created motion graphic content for the university video walls, as well as various recruitment and other video projects. He went on to serve as the library's associate director for technology and operations before leaving to move to Atlanta in 2018. He completed the script, graphics, and edited the Central State Hospital Oral History Documentary Project, 10 years in the making in 2021. His current work includes independent video, motion graphics, and digital photo restoration projects. Please everyone help me in welcoming Joe Windish to the Georgia Archives. Thank you, Robin. Thank you all for being here and welcoming me. Uh, I uh, have worked a long time on this, so I'm really happy to be here and uh, make this presentation. And this is actually, you're the ideal audience, the perfect place for this to be. Um, so let's get going. Uh, when, so we're going to look at five videos. And when I originally was doing these videos, they are the uh, trailers for the documentary. And I literally thought of them as a course that we would teach over six weeks. And each one, I would get area experts to talk about the topics that are raised. Um, so I'm going to try and give us all it today um, and say, I'm not the expert. I'm not an expert. I do know this information. Um, and I know the story and I have opinions and they are informed opinions and I'll share them. And I'll be looking forward to hearing yours. Uh, where this project came from is that I was living and working in Milledgeville as were Daniel McDonald and Steve Price. Steve Price was in our um, uh, mass media department training in people in video production. Daniel McDonald was a started out as a local newspaper reporter who then came to work in the library and so he was always very interested in these subjects i learned last summer we did a screening of this at central state hospital and the three of us were there back together again because they've all gone off, we've all gone off in our different directions and i learned then that i brought them together so I was part of this project right from the start, but really my role at the start was that I was over the library's uh, media resources, which were the university shared resources so I could give them editing equipment. I could, I could, I could provide support. And so where did it start? It started because in 2007, the AJC did an investigative report into death. And as a consequence of that, and I think there were I don't want to get, there were many deaths, questionable deaths found in that report. And that spurred a Justice Department investigation. The Justice Department investigation came up with a um, agreement with the state on improvements to be made to the services provided to people with mental disabilities in this state. And in 2010, it resulted in the Powell Building, which I call the heart and soul, which was the prime building, is that building in the picture, um, closed. And so when did the hospital close is a tricky question. There's still elements of it that are open today. So did it close? <laughs> you know, but I call that the closing. But again, that is where uh, Daniel and Steve we're like, this is happening now. We've got to document it. And so they started shooting interviews with people. And so when I was leaving Georgia College, I thought I wanted a project to go with me and I offered to edit it for them. And I ended up doing that through COVID. And it gave me a good project to do. Um, 
the reason that I'm saying uh, underscoring oral history is because essentially what the project is, is people telling the stories as they knew it. That's what we had. Now, I've embedded that, those interviews, in um, the fact of the course of the history of the hospital. And the place where those facts came from are But for the Grace of God by Peter Cranford. This was a book published in the 60s. He worked, uh, he was a hospital employee who kept a diary and said he is the person who really documents the history of the hospital in the 60s. I mean, from the beginning. And so I rely a lot on him. The second place is um, Mab Zegrest, who uh, was a visiting scholar at Georgia College while she wrote the book, Administrations of Lun Lunacy. And so she's also interviewed there, but where do the factual histories come from? That's where. And so with that, let's look at the first video. And these videos are all three minutes. There's an old Southern saying, the breath of man keeps a house alive. And when people move out and close it up, it starts deteriorating. And if you ride through Central State and look at the buildings, I'm uh, amazed at the deterioration. You know, the very word asylum, this simply means a refuge, a retreat. In order to restore people to sanity, put them in an orderly, rural, structured environment. Lunatics, epileptics, idiots in the terms of the day could be cured within the institution by what was called the moral therapy. It was a really racist view. Black people aren't so subject to mental illness because we take care of them so much. Which is so preposterous, huge amounts of stress associated with slavery. But the myth then was, oh no, they had it good, we took care of them. They having a bad time now, they just should have stayed slaves. Years ago, under antiquated laws, there were people in Central State Hospital that truly were not mentally ill. They were wards of the state. Their families had left them there. You know, back when Central State Hospital was the only hospital, it was like, oh yeah, you went off to Central State and you like disappeared, you know, down a hole. You might come home, you might not. I realized that there was this huge institution taking care of people that maybe didn't need to be there and that at my level there wasn't much I could do. There was apparently a period where they actually did not medicate, not restrain, not seclude, and people moved on. I wasn't around for that. By the time we were around, there was medication, seclusion, restraint. I thought society was ready to acknowledge the fact that you shouldn't stuff people in institutional settings. But the law was way behind. There was a clear playing field, in a sense, to just focus on why are people in these institutional settings at all and in the first place. I saw that you got to ah. Washington, D.C. and give a, a um, painting to President Obama. Yeah, I did. I really did. I traveled. Can you tell me about meeting him and getting to, you know, give well, him? Well, I, I met him at the White Quarter House in Washington, D.C. Mm. We were standing on there three nights. I realized that if there were to be a thesis statement for my presentation, it is that everything that was true in 1842 from a from a 30,000 foot view is still true. <laughs> that you know, and so that's just my overview. But so what how did the hospital come to be? It was called for by the public and the sheriffs. At that time, mentally ill were kept in jails. Log huts, there was abuse. Uh, the, uh, the legislature did a census and found 428 people, and they approved opening the hospital. Milledgeville was the capital. It was in Milledgeville. It's important. Two points. No taxes. People didn't pay. Uh, the money came from the lottery system used to uh, sell off 
indigenous lands. And the second thing is that in order to be admitted, you had to have the courts judge you and admit you. But 1877, if legislature makes it free, and there I say dumping begins, never ends. It just becomes a place where you, you know, when you are overwhelmed, here's an answer. And that's what the hospital, that's what happened. Um, important about race. So the hospital absolutely reflected the, um, the times. Um, import, uh, significantly, there was this belief that because we took care of the slaves, we took care of them so well, they didn't have all of the anxieties and pressures of modern life. And so, you know, they were, it was believed that they didn't have mental illness. And I actually wanted to point out that uh, the Florida education is now saying, you know, that uh, slavery was good for some people, so some slaves. So what I'm saying by saying that is I believe that though that echo of that belief continues throughout. Um, but 1858, a law that said insane slaves had to be committed, and um, then overcrowding starts with a civil war. So the civil war, men go away, women left at home with, could not take care of people needing care, put them in the hospital. Um, and so you, you get to, this comes from, uh, again, Cranford, by 1874, the hospital had two functions, care for the truly insane, and a haven for those who had no place else to go. So. Now I'm jumping to the courts because that's, that. actually that first uh, trailer I did, one of the most significant things. So Lois Curtis is a Georgia re a resident, in and out of the hospital 30 times, by the time uh, 1995, she asked for help. And the thesis is, I mean, the Sue James and I, we point out that in and out of the hospital, getting not getting the care she needed. So custodial, the hospital is custodial. Um, and the Supreme Court in 1999, in the Olmstead decision, Olmstead was the Georgia Human Rights Commissioner. So he got the, I mean, Human Resources, Human Resources Commissioner. Um, uh, so anyway, that's how it got that name. But what the law did is extend the ADA to people with disabilities. Now, then there is the whole story of who closed the hospitals, what closed the hospitals, and we'll get into that in a, but, um, you know, it's presumed that the courts closed the hospital. And so it's important in the decision, it explicitly says, that we emphasize that nothing in the ADA or its implementing, so extending the ADA to people with intellectual disabilities, but they explicitly say it does not condone termination of institutional settings. So they're saying, we're not saying close the hospitals. <laughs> That, I mean, there is the language. And um, so we're going to spend a little more time on this, come back to it again. Uh, but I'm going to go now to the next, uh, uh, next video. I'm sorry if you're having problems hearing. Uh, we're doing the best we can with the volume. Yes? Do you want questions during or? Um, go ahead. <laughs> To some extent, I don't. I want to really get through it as much as I can, but I absolutely don't want us to lose the question. Go ahead. Well, I noticed it said the slaves when they the former slaves. <laughs> okay, the maybe my was, language was wrong there, but yeah. no, no, they wouldn't be. Well, yes, they would be. Now, if you said the overcrowding started during the Civil War. Yeah. Is that because of uh, shell shock and etc. Uh, among the returning uh, veterans? My answer is that I don't know, and that's where it would be good to have an expert here. Um, what I what was 
I'm again quoting Cranford. And what he basically said is, so I think that the first overcrowding was the fact that because men were going off to war, people who were taken care of at home were immediately sent to the hospital. It just was a convenient, it was, that is my understanding. What you're um, suggesting may have compounded it because again, it started there, it never ended. There was never a time from then on that the hospital had, um, was not overcrowded. It just didn't happen. Thank you. So did they use um, the hospital to close down other hospitals or are you talking about this hospital where I have these closed down? Well, did you use this as a figure or effect to close down other? There were no other hospitals. And when this, there were no other mental, this was the mental institution for the state. There was no other mental institution. There was no, it was the place. I don't really know about hospitals in general, but I do know that this was the single first and the single place for people with intellectual disabilities for mental people to come until the 1960s. Okay, are we ready? Here we go with the next one. If you were from Milledgeville and you went anywhere in the state and you introduced yourself and you said, I'm from Milledgeville, it was always a joke. How did you get out? The word Milledgeville meant a mental hospital. If you come from Atlanta or anywhere else in Georgia, you say, I'm going to Milledgeville, you know, they go like, oh, you're going to Milledgeville. I hope they let you out. More people know that this was the home of the mental asylum than uh, they know that it was ever the capital. You know, back when Central State Hospital was the only hospital, it was like, oh yeah, you went off to Central State and you like disappeared, you know, down a hole. You might come home, you might not. Doors are wide open. If, you know, it was like, if you, if you fall down the chute that takes you to Central State, it's an uphill battle to get out. You know, you must be mentally ill, that's why you're here. It was really inhumane the way they uh, did down there. I was given shock treatments. I had 25 shock treatments. I, as a young adult, uh, to work my way through junior college, I participated in shock treatment. Thorazine was as important to psychiatric treatment as penicillin was to the general public because in the 1950s you had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people locked up in institutions. How once Thorazine came out, they were able to go out into the public settings. I stayed there for a year working with the mentally retarded adolescents, and a group I worked with pretty, pretty much like other kids. And so I, I kind of wondered, well, you know, why are they here? And I realized that there was this huge institution taking care of people that maybe didn't need to be there. I think that what we have done in the state of Georgia, we have deinstitutionalized people out of clinical beds and we are slowly reinstitutionalizing them in correctional beds. You lock them up or put them in a clinical bed and, and hold them in a, in a institution, a clinical institution, and they will get placards and they will walk up and down the road and protest. But we have thousands in jails and prison and they don't open their mouth. The Justice Department gets involved through something called CRIPA, the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act. Uh, the law enforcement community has always been interested in this issue um, because uh, many people just cycle into their jails. I've read the agreement between the Justice Department and the state of Georgia four or five times. There's nothing, nothing anywhere in this agreement that says to close any hospital specific in this state. Okay, so here we get to the first half of the 20th century. So 19th century, we can still say that the basic methodology was this um, moral therapy. Live in the green, live in the peace. We can bring peace to these people and give them. 
by the 20th century, now we're trying all kinds of, now we're in scientific theories. And so, as you saw, and uh, the different uh, kinds of therapies. But importantly, it the numbers got so high and the funding stayed so low on a per patient basis and the number of doctors that it basically was custodial. It, it just housed these people. Um, and these devices and these therapies could become, as you heard her say, punishments. So, and you could actually say that this person in their screaming needs to be treated with this treatment or the person could be mad about their, anyway. Uh, so statistics, more patients returned home dead than alive, 1921. Um, and then we get to, so the scientific theory was eugenics. You're born with it. You, these different people have these predispositions and everything. But what is absolutely important to wonder, to recognize is that at the same time, these crowding conditions without modern uh, notions of sanitary cleaning things, anyway, disease was rampant. And these diseases, each in their um, advanced stages, have expressions that can be, that are completely similar to mental illness. So the, we're looking at all these causes over here and not even seeing the causes over here, which leads Mab to say that penicillin would cure tuberculosis and syphilis, and in doing so, Pellagra was about nutrition. In fixing those, you cured a whole bunch of people of the mental illnesses that you were hypothesizing were a function of genetics or all these other things. So um, this is the story of the early 20th century. And then it bridges into, so now let's go another video. Here we go, another video. When I go there now, sad is the word that comes to mind. This was my home. It was beautiful then, but it's, it's not anymore. You know, the very word asylum, this simply means a refuge, a retreat. In order to restore people to sanity, put them in an orderly, rural, structured environment. Lunatics, epileptics, idiots in the terms of the day could be cured within the institution. They're very much wanting to, like, get people well. That part of the story is over by 1900. I and mean, it becomes eugenic by the turn of the century, where there's certain populations that are just that way. There was reason to fear being sent to uh, Milledgeville. They were understaffed. There was a lot of brutality. Horror stories abound. And of course, you have to think now, there were 12,000 patients at that time. And air condition was, I don't remember it. It was just another hot, sticky, smelly day. Back in those days, there were nothing but cloth diapers. So all these clients had cloth diapers or underwear on. The smell in these buildings was unbelievable. I grew up on a farm, so I'm used to bad smells. Nothing prepared me for what I went through back in those days. And so it really was something you couldn't walk away from because you knew if you could do something, you ought to do it. So we knew we could. And uh, there was so much that needed to be done. Oh, oh, just so much. When the exodus of, of the professionals from Cuba started, it was well known that, that dad would take doctors and put them to work at state hospital. The Cuban crisis mm. probably saved the hospital. At, at any given time, there were probably 100 doctors. We actually came in what was part of the freedom flights. 
We were one of the last groups who came in those freedom flights. You know, you came to the United States with nothing, whatever you were wearing. Uh, but we did fine. My dad, just because of his opportunities here. So now we're at the second half of the 20th century. And in 1959, Jack Nelson in the Atlanta Constitution wrote a series, won a Pulitzer Prize um, for, it was called Milledgeville Snake Pit, um, how bad the situation was in the hospital. Um, 48 doctors for 15,000 patients. I want to say the number of patients. So there were 12,000 patients housed there. There were another 3,000 that would be across the state or that that were outpatient coming to Milledgeville for treatment, so counted as their patient load. Um, and uh, so this was the pressure on Ernest Vanderveer, governor, to do something and brought attention and got them to go and see. And you heard those stories of what was true of the uh, environment in the hospital. And so the Cuban immigrants, suddenly a hundred doctors, you know, when you're seeing these ratios of doctors to patients, this became a real answer um, for that time. I stick Jimmy Carter here. Jimmy Carter is in the um, House or Senate at that point in the state of Georgia before he was governor in the 70s, whatever. But Jimmy Carter definitely took on um, uh, mental health as an issue that he wanted, you know, in the hospitals to solve the problem of the hospitals. Um, and so here comes decentralization. So we, we have these, this huge hospital where everybody is warehoused and the sort of the, the simplest, cleanest, clearest, easy answer right now is put them closer to people, you know, so you would have people there. She, Betty Vander talks about one of the most important things they did in, the, in that time was um, uh, all the mayors acro across Georgia would get together and do the mayor's motorcade, bring the presents, Christmas presents to the patients because there would be people who didn't have a visitor for year after year, just were left in the hospital and lost. Um, so on the human side, they, they were trying to do that. And on the other about institutionally by moving the hospitals out across the state uh, bring people closer to their um, families and people who can visit them. Uh, again, funding is never enough. So here I want to go to who closed the hospital. And I was putting Jimmy Carter there. Jimmy Carter is a, uh, some people in Milledgeville, you know, he closed the hospital <laughs> because of that decentralization thing. But let's look at a history of closing the hospital. So the last legislation legislation that John Kennedy signed was the Community Mental Health Act. He signed it on October 31st, 1963. Um, and the idea was already then about getting people out of these hospitals, which are custodial, which are underfunded, which put them in community settings where you can provide community services, give grants. And it never got the funding that was in, envisioned for it. But Johnson, me, Medicaid meant you could actually use Medicaid funds now. Of course, hospitals wanted to claim those funds, uh, the problem. Of, then we get Reagan, you know, and I'm saying this now because all, everywhere I go, I hear people talking about who closed the hospital and you get, and to me, the answer is everyone and no one. The hospitals aren't closed. <laughs> But they're close, or the politicians. Never mind. I'll get back to it. Uh, but Reagan, you know, is another could be a bogeyman. He turned it into block grants. The last money from that Community Mental Health Act. Now it's gone. Goes in block grants. And are those block grants? Do we know how we can write uh, topics for block grants? Oh, this helps. Well, you know, is it really? And then the real the Supreme Court. There we get back to that Olmstead decision. That one, it closed the hospital, dumped the people out on the street. I wonder if this is the point to say 
first of all, to understand that the hospitals, we look back and we think, oh, the hospitals were one thing in terms of homelessness in the United States or and drug problems. I remember as a child visiting the Bowery in New York City and the people sleeping on the streets. If we go to the depression, we have a long history of unhoused people. Um, hospitals as an answer can be custodial. Let's put them into a hospital where we don't look at them, underfund, not treat. Um, So, but hospitals are the best care we can possibly give. We all, if we have, we want, even for any treatment, we want to go into the hospital. We don't want to be thrown out real quick. So we all want to be in hospitals as appropriate. Now, there are advocates who have enough of that history that they don't want anybody ever put in a hospital. That's true. There are those advocates. But mental health professionals generally agree that the, the bigger challenge in Georgia today is finding a bed. You want to put someone in the hospital, where's the bed? And that gets us back to who pays for the beds. So anyway, we will continue. It's, it's um, not so simple about uh, reopen the hospitals or the ho opening and closing the hospitals is a tricky straw man to deal with. Sheriffs, um, so I want to get Massey. We're going to talk about him again, who was interviewed in there. And we're going to, uh, the 1840s, when we opened the first hospital, it was the, the county jail had the drunks and the drunks were taken up the jail and they were a distraction to the sheriff. The sheriffs were big movers in wanting that hospital in the first place and they are still the big movers today. I mean, because the jails are de facto mental institutions. I mean, or mental people with mental disabilities find their ways into jails and the jails have to deal with them. Um, oh, so the alcohol problem, again, we have drugs today, whatever the drugs are, we had alcohol throughout. And throughout the history of the hospital, there is this negotiation of how you deal with them. And um, the laws were changed to deal with them. Um, so, but now I wanna, so this is kind of the last subject video and then we can talk more. Um, I do have another video after that, but the question of, what are these community resources supposed to be? What, if not a hospital, what is it that advocates want for um, people with mental disabilities? So here we go. My position is maybe if we had community-based programs and we had clinical beds for people in crisis, maybe we would be able to help them function in our society and in our community. You've either got to have clinical bed space or you've got to have excellent community-based programs. The ACT team uh, stands for Assertive Community Treatment. Um, it's a team of providers, um, including nurses, counselors, substance abuse counselors, vocational specialists, peer specialists, and case managers. Uh, we work together to serve those people who have a severe and persistent mental illness. Um, so they most likely are having some skills deficits in the areas of their daily living, could be hygiene, could be housing. They also have most likely been in hospitals um, frequently or incarcerated frequently. So we go to their homes or to the community to work with them, and typically daily to multiple times daily if needed. Um, and we're also available 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year to them. Uh, we've had one client who was homeless that uh, we, after him being whereabouts unknown for three or four days, we found him dumpster diving behind the Kroger's in Macon and we're able to reconnect with him and get him his medicines. And we just, again, we take the treatment to the streets The Permanent Supportive Housing Program is intended to serve primarily individuals who are coming from a homeless status 
who have a disability, either behavioral health, mental health, substance abuse, or co-occurring disorders. The, the person that we initially see that sometimes come with bad hygiene, um, only one set of clothes, not able to take a bath, um, and then once we put them in a place, uh, an apartment, with just the basic living items, how they will take so much pride in keeping them clean. And it helps us over the course of time really learn that the person that we may perhaps brought from under the, under the bridge that presented so straggly uh, was really not the person within. Uh, it is amazing how an apartment can actually motivate their self-esteem and bring out the best in actually bringing back who they were once upon a time before they fell into this crisis that then took them to having to live in a place that was not meant for human habitation. It's educating people in the community to realize that, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. Recovery is possible. Now, in this, uh, in that video, I left one out, and that was peer support. And so there is another program, and it's active here in Georgia, where people with mental disabilities are paid to provide services to others, so that it's peer support, people who understand what's going on. These services are time take a lot of time and, um, you know, the, so ACT Teams, Assertive Community Treatment, started in Minneapolis in the 80s. It is across the country. Um, and that is, and you can hear, I mean, most recently I heard a story of a therapist who worked with a woman for over a year before he could get her to trust him to take medication. Um, so it's time, these people are doing God's work. Um, housing, housing can be where the person would rather live. So there are, that we know the danger of um, shelters. You can be very vulnerable in a shelter. Um, you can feel safer or Moving someone from being unhoused to housed is not just, oh, here's a house, and you come in and you're comfortable. So these are time intensive, but this is the work that we need to do. So again, the sheriffs, I'm going coming back to the sheriffs and saying that the Justice Department settlement that we started out with, the history, I mean, the goals, were they met? I'm not certain. By now, we need new goals. The populations have changed. And we so back in 2022, there was real effort to get a comprehensive mental health bill in Georgia, failed. 2023, tried again. Uh, some little trickle of it made it through, but no. 2024, we had two bills, and here's the bills that, that we had. One was about suicide in high school, in schools, and um, but it became a Franken bill. It became the bill that they put all of the social issues, trans, sports, all that stuff into that bill, it failed. And then the other one that failed was for first responders to get, to provide uh, mental health care for first responders, it failed. So those two failed. So the only two, the only bills we can get in, a mental health bill for all of the people with mental health challenges. <laughs> and I do want to say, protect the children or the children. These people are, are those children grown up. <laughs> you know, the problems, they have real problems we can care about, should care about. Anyway, um, but the only bills we can even entertain do with some sympathetic subset. Oh, teens who might commit suicide or first responders, not the whole population. We don't even look at the whole population. All right, so um, so I do, I'll just, this is my last video and this is, so the theme of we never are willing to pay. 
Um, and what you hear these people say is we pay one way or another. The institutionalization was premised on the, on the assumption that people would be closer to home and there would be community care. But really the community care part never really got put in place. So deinstitutionalization becomes transinstitutionalization, where um, the people with mental illness are kind of shuttled between and among the new homeless shelters because we cut all the subsidized housing or much of it, police and jails, bridges, and hospitals, you know, just shuffling around that way. And so in this transinstitutionalized place, um, the prison and the jail become the, the spaces where state hospitals used to be. What's the most striking and haunting to me is the number of these brick state hospital buildings that were transposed to prisons. So you have this dreadful barbed wire glinting silver still after decades and decades there around these fences. The average citizen is paying for mental health care, but they're paying for it in prisons and in jails, uh, in homeless shelters. They're not paying for it where people can actually recover and become productive citizens. Actually, it's, it's sort of a losing proposition. They're, they're, they're paying the bare minimum with no results. And if, if more money were paid for treatments out there, if you can get it, I mean, there is treatment available. There are medications, there are uh, professionals, there are groups, there are activities, organizations. But people can't access it because of transportation or money, some of those issues. But the mentally ill do get treated. They just don't get treated well. And the average taxpayer, if they think you're saving money by not funding your local mental health center, it's, you know, you're kind of whistling past the graveyard because you are going to be paying for the local police, the local courts, the local jail, because that's what mentally they're, they're winding up. When the deinstitutionalization happened uh, years ago. The promise was to give them services in the community, but the funding that was supposed to go to the community services just never happened. The reality is that whether or not um, you think that uh, the government should or should not provide a robust community mental health system is that the government is going to spend a significant amount of money on mental health, whether it does it well or whether it does it poorly, because it's going to spend it in our emergency rooms, it's going to spend it in our jails and prisons. So, this concludes the presentation. I appreciate you being here. I'm sorry for the sound problems. I do have one more opinion to vocalize. And I welcome other opinions. You know, I hope we can engage all of us in our communities in, on this topic. There is so much going out there that we have so much other stuff to talk about that, again, these people fall through the cracks. But I do believe it's a public policy decision that in Europe, you do not see, in Western Europe, you don't see mentally disturbed, homeless people on the streets. There are services. And we have chosen by inaction for nearly two centuries to let it be. So that's my sad summation. <laughs> so, anybody have questions or thoughts? Well, I had a relative that was at the military, and they had shot tree. This was in the 50s, and it worked. And back then, that was the only place you could get that type of truth. But for my relative, I mean, it, it, there was success. Yeah, and later on, that relative went on drugs. They have drugs now, for it. And, but it worked for them then. So again, you know, I don't think you saw me demonize any treatments. Yeah. I did demonize the use of a treatment as punishment. And even that, I can say that I understand. These people who worked in the hospitals, and the, overall the documentary is very sensitive and uh, empathetic, understands 
compassionate towards both the people who were served by the hospital and the people who were doing working in the hospital. It was the people in the hospitals who identified the problems to the reporters. So, and the, again, the, the ratios you see of patients to providers are overwhelming. And so when we are in an overwhelming, this does not mean that there aren't treat, you know, the treat, to, um, uh, shock treatment is being looked at again and again. And I think there is, I, I, again, I'm not expert or knowledgeable, but I most recently within the past year saw more reports on how it's used. And it, so, and when we go into barbarism, leeches, you know, me, not mental health, regular health, we put leeches, whatever we did with elixirs, you know, so it's, it, we had to go through the process we had to go through. I understand that. And, uh, you know, I am against custodial warehousing and dumping of people in there. I am all for treatment. Again, the gold standard of treatment is inpatient treatment. I would love these people to be able to, the same of the, with the ACT team, one-on-one, -on -one, coming out, getting to know, helping the person. Um, that's what we're advocating for. So what are they doing to help people with mental problems today? What happens to them? Where are they going to help? Well, the behavioral health, uh, Department of Behavioral Health, I don't, but we have a crisis and action line. We have a line where you can call. If, the, if somebody, if you run into somebody out here who is threatening their life or threatening, you can call behavioral health, the crisis and action line. They, they should be able to find a bed in the state to put the person in there, you know, so they are trying to provide services I am saying that those services are underfunded. So when did, when did they close the regional hospitals? I don't know. So there was one in Atlanta on Briar. Yeah. Oh, good. It's important to just say about Lois. Lois Curtis, Decatur resident in that hospital. That's the, the she had been in, in her 30 hospitalizations. She was once in Milledgeville. But where the case came from that went to the Supreme Court was the Atlanta Regional Hospital that you're talking about. Uh, Lois pa did live after the decision, lived on her own. A nonprofit was set up to take care of her. She lived in her home indicator where she was interviewed. She passed last year and it was noted in the AJC. And it was uh, anyway, but uh, I don't know that um, the other hospitals were closed. But um, the I don't know either. The, so I don't know about the other house. I used to work with adult protective services in Michael and I heard a mental health that's between someone she saw mental drug lab and it was. And I think, like you said, with the laws in Georgia, so much happened to the they wanted people felt it was better to deinstitutionalize people. And the only services I'm aware of, and I haven't done direct social work in a long time, but um, are outpatient mental health, which anybody can really go to in these programs like ACT, where they kind of do case management, try to keep tabs. I had clients who were in personal care homes. Um, they did okay, but still people would wander. I remember going around the Kirkwood area trying to find a man who had escaped from a, a personal care home because we all want our freedom, you know. I, but I don't, I, I think about what is the answer. I mean, I think better facilities, not like Central State. The other trend, I think, if, if you're lucky to have sort of lucky to have private insurance because back in the 70s and if you had you know a serious mental illness and you were hospitalized because you were psychotic or suicidal or homicidal you might stay for a month or two but now often you know you're discharged when you're no longer a risk of harm to self or others and of course when I worked in medical social work we would do, it's called the 1013, an involuntary commitment. 
for somebody who is um, suicidal or or homicidal. You know, 2013 was somebody who was at risk because of substance abuse. But I often tell people who are complaining about a crazy neighbor or friend who's threatening is you can take a lay affidavit, but two people have to witness. It's hard, or you can call the sheriff or police or the crisis line. Um, I worked there for a short period of time, but I remember in training that said someone called us last week. He'd already shot and killed his wife, and he was threatening suicide. But um, people have to want treatment, or that they're so bad that. They are at risk of harming someone else, rather, they can be committed, but it's a hard process because you're violating people's rights, you know, to roam in a site. Georgia Regional is still open off Pantersville Road, but I, I don't, I know they have a forensic unit anymore, maybe more of a long term unit for people that really have no other options. So, anyway, that's my. Not two cents, what I know. Um, one thing to say about a, a millage though. So the, the all these buildings, these big, old, beautiful buildings, rehabbing those buildings is expensive. <laughs> it may honestly be cheaper to build a new building because you have asbestos, you have lead, you have all kinds of things that were in those buildings. Plus you have all the... so. One of the costs of the build of these is the history of the building. Um, yes. As an example of uh, paying for their care through other ways, um, I met uh, C uh, on the East Point path. I was riding my bicycle and she was laying down on, uh, I think just a blanket in the underpass and uh i guess we became friends and i would talk to her and, and you know give her some food on occasion and those kind of things and then i would notice that she's not there and it turns out that she's in the hospital so instead of you know making available to her a housing option that she would like because she wouldn't go to shelters because she saw those as dangerous. Um, the we were paying for hospital days. So the thing is that we do pay for their treatment, for their homelessness or their um, mental problems or whatever, but in other methods. So it's much better if we can cut it off at the past, you might say, and uh, make some kind of uh, housing available to homeless people and mentally uh, ill people have a hospital situation or whatever. Yes, one thing I didn't, I think I had stigma listed as something I was going to address. And the truth of stigma, you know, for whatever reason. And so when we're talking about the person wandering away from their house, I kind of remember and who knows is is it's a true memory or not? But Mayberry RFD or what? What you know? Where the notion was, oh, he's the town drunk, or he's the where the there was a kind of this notion of community caring. And what you just shared was community caring for a person who is unhoused and unwell and in need. And uh, so one thing I would love. To, for us to see is that we start caring about these people. And again, starting back when the dumping in the 1800s, out of sight and every socioeconomic group, all of us were for whatever uncomfortable reason, out of sight. And in the documentary, people talk beautifully about that one thing about Milledgeville where it was, there was, uh caring for these people you know there was seeing them as people and there was uh, so whatever when the bus pulls up and they're getting off and we don't want to look when they're in the store and we're like why are they in this store i mean what a what what a thought <laughs>
you know, and and the people who worked in Milledgeville who took the patients to places saw firsthand the discomfort of many of us with others who are less fortunate than us. One of the other things I forgot to mention is that uh, in Georgia, about nine months out of the year, it's okay to be outside with a blanket sleeping. But those three months when it's getting down below freezing and such, and it was getting get down into the teens when I was talking to uh, Kathy. And uh, eventually uh, somebody gave her a tent and that improved her life uh, substantially. And she'd pick up a blanket here, a sleeping bag here, and was able to survive. And then eventually the, the city of East Point got her a place. This would be fine if, like you said, through Johnson, President Johnson on Medicaid and uh, on down. I hope I like to know is block is uh, writing grants the only way we can get bonds to get the places in better condition. If you know, since we going to have to have for uh, a long time, I'd remain about life. Uh, can you write block grants? You know? Well, if you're writing a grant, you have to write a grant to somebody who's giving money. <laughs> and my the I don't know about all the sources for money. What I do know is that they are extremely limited and they are not up to the task. And so that, you know, we need public policy decisions that are different. We need we. Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> So we're having a tax cut this year. We have uh, in the state, we have a, so uh, income tax cut. We have a surplus, but our thing is, oh, our, so our elected representatives have chosen that the values are to give the money back to us and to let these needs be unmet. That, that is a public policy decision that we made. And so I don't, we need to vote differently. We need to make it a, you know. Uh, they're never going to put that in this legislation. And I mean, I gave you the two examples of the two bills that yeah. made it in this year. And then these are put what variety, they're going to use variety. But I want to, actually, the, the mayor is doing, you know, work on housing. Um, in, in And one of the, you know, it's, all of these topics is where I would have a panel of people who have expertise in the different areas because there are competing forces. <laughs> but um, in terms of housing is a big complicated topic, but the, the, they are doing a, a, a service providing place and they are doing housing. Is it enough housing for the census of unhoused people? No but they're making a work effort in that direction. And even if you've made enough housing for the unhoused people, as you were saying, it's going to take work, somebody individually to work with the individual to move them into the house. <laughs> so it, it is a big question. Um, so I've done extensive research on Central State Hospital, and I do want to ask, um, have you ever found not an official timeline, but rather a, you know, manually constructed, I guess, timeline of the series of expansions the hospital experienced? Because that's the one thing I've been trying to hunt down. Because it's I so have fun. not. Okay. <laughs> um, and I was going to say, in, in another experience that I did have, so I worked on uh, inventorying stuff from Central State Hospital for the state because Georgia College was paid to do that for a while. Where it is, is it in the Georgia archive? Is it in, uh, I, I don't know. And so, no, I didn't find it. And when you're saying, what did I, I mean, when I named the two things I found, I didn't find a lot. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, are there records existing about patients in Central State over the historical period, and if so, are they accessible? 
I was going to say, I was actually going to address that kind of near the end. Okay, um, got it. We do get questions a lot about patient records here at the Georgia Archives because we do hold some of those records. Mm -hmm. However, um, there's a lot of state and federal laws about patient privacy and the time that's required. Yeah. So like HIPAA um, has a, st a statute on the number of years. The Georgia, um, I had it here. The uh, Georgia Records Act also has a stipulation on those. So the best way to find out is to either write in to our Ask an Archivist uh, button on the website and just submit your question and find out if there's a particular person that you're looking for. Um, if it's a family relative, you may have to provide you know, legal documentation saying that you're their legal representative, things like that. So we can help you as far as, you know, determining whether they're accessible or not. And that's probably the best way to do it is by writing into that asking arguments or stopping by down in the reference room downstairs and they can help, help you guide, guide you in those. And it's complex and complicated and there's no quick, easy answer, unfortunately. <laughs> and what I'll say in terms of the documentary is you don't see me showing pictures of the hospital and when there are, I mean, of people. Mm -hmm. And when there are pictures, there's all kinds of stuff all over them and you don't see them. And the reason is because for the same reason there. Now, the trick of that is it just legal and once it's free, it's free. You know, but again, the stigma that you're so in some ways, uh, I was not being as ex I was not as explicit as I could have been in terms of using any images, um, just trying to respect. So the, uh, the re some records do exist. They weren't destroyed. As far as I understand, yes. Um, the reference archivist can really into those questions. And when I was working in terms of inventory, handwritten records, yes. You know, now, again, I, I mean, the stuff that I personally was working with were, you know, so I am somebody just describing something, you know, so it's not the level of detail and all that kind of stuff. In terms of what I saw, I was not in medical records, really, so. But. The uh, Georgia Genealogical Society newsletter, I think it took them three issues to get all the names of the people who were buried at to Milledgeville. The, uh, so one thing that is missing from this and that they didn't interview anybody and I don't know that there was anybody to talk about is the unmarked graves that were there. And I heard somebody at the beginning talking about markers and Cranford, I mean, the, the community nonprofit that was set up that was in the 60s into the 70s, wherever or the most big advocate really did a lot of work on identifying and trying to respect and probably did what you're the, the documents that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that is not something that was in that they it recorded. So it's not it is a terrible missing piece because it's so important that so many people, and it does really make the ground their sacred ground. So many people who passed and, you know, at first it was unmarked graves, um, so. Like, but are there any books about history? So I referenced two, and it's Peter, Peter Cranford, uh, for, for the grace of God and um, Mab Seacrest on uh, administration of lunacy. I can give them the exact titles afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry they don't come off the top of my head. Uh, I, uh, somebody who couldn't be here today wrote a fictional novel about a per based on a person who was a patient there. There may be other stuff around when. Do you know it? Um, Share it. I know you. Um, if you go to um, Megan's Washington Library, they have the Don Skank Jr. Papers, which was a series of papers in the 80s that were published. Um, if you go to the Atlanta Journal Constitution, they have all of Jack Nelson's on microfilm. Um, I know Maps Agress also made two more publications online, but they're short articles as well. Okay. Thanks. 
So what's interesting, I thought maybe you, what you just, I knew about those things. <laughs> and to me, it's a dearth. It's like, there's not, and it's, I think it's because uh, it's in Milledgeville. Yeah. You know, people don't, if it was in Atlanta, there'd be all kinds of books around it. You know, um, it's often Milledgeville again. Uh, so, the, because it's under um, documented and it really is a, a story. The, the story of Milledgeville is the story of mental health care in America. Like, I don't care what state you go to. You don't have some state where you say, oh, look how it worked there. <laughs> it, this was, and when we were the biggest, that mm -hmm. gives us some, but uh, it, this was the common practice in this country. Anybody else? Any? Your uh, documentary is available at the URL that was yes. displayed. So let me actually that versions. So the important thing from Daniel McDonald's perspective was to capture these interviews. So there is a one hour and forty five minute uh, version that really gets the beauty of what these people are saying. It is still edited down, so you take some of the ums and ahs and the tangents that I always use, but it is everything they said. Then there is a 40-minute version that is much more, you know, uh, and that's the 40-minute the version is what we put in festivals, and that's the one that's linked from here. Um, and what I call the hour and 45-minute is archival for researchers. <laughs> and... Steve is making a website for all of them. I do have them right now on a Vimeo page, so I can give you the URLs for them. What's the next topic for uh, the next uh, lecture for next month? What's the next month's topic? <laughs> I guess I'm out of here. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. So our next Lunch and Learn will be Tony Barnhart. He will be here on May 10th to talk about his book, The 19 of Green. I also wanted to tell you a little bit about what we have coming up this summer. We are putting together programming for our upcoming summer genealogy event, which is now named Genealogy at the Archives. We'll be releasing that information coming up soon via social media channels and our subscriber email. If you would like to join our email list, please visit georgiaarchives.org where we have a subscription box on that homepage. As always, please explore our Facebook and our Instagram and our YouTube pages for more insights and updates. We will be sharing Mr. Windish's presentation on our YouTube page next week, and you can find more videos about the archives and our previous events, including our previous Lunch and Learn presentations there as well. We did just add the sessions from our April History Symposium that revolved around the history of agriculture in our state. So please check that out um, as well. Thank you again, everyone, and please feel free to stay and chat with other attendees.